Hi, everyone, and welcome to a CISC special guest webinar. Uh, you have to be this tall to ride, how standards help improve your organization's software quality. Uh, my name is Tracy Berardi. I'm program manager of CISC, uh, kicking us off today. Um, so I'm here with John Marion, our guest speaker. He's a chief software engineer at MITRE. John has just completed, or he's actually still doing uh, even more research after completing uh, code quality evaluations on over 100 government IT systems. So he's going to present his, uh, his findings and some commentary uh, on this. So it's a very exciting uh, webinar. We've included in the handouts tab um, a PDF download of the presentation slides. So if you want to grab that, you'll see that in the, in the toolbar. And we can also take questions. Um, and John's agreed, you know, we could take questions throughout the presentation. We'll also save some time towards the end of the presentation. So go ahead and, and enter your questions at any time. Um, I'll be taking a look at that and uh, you know, making the, the call, you know, to take the question now or 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 later on. So so feel free. Um, and yeah, I think also Dr. Curtis may be hopping on here in a second as well uh, to join us for some of the Q&A. Dr. Bill Curtis is the founding executive director of, of CISC, and, and Bill and John uh, go back a long time um, and, and are buddies. So, so John, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Why don't I give you the presenter control so you can share your screen and your slides. I'll do that now. Okay, let me know if, if you see that okay. Okay, I can see that. Let me see if I have the right monitor showing. Which screen do you I, see? I, can, I see your PowerPoint. I see the, the presenter view. So I think you could go into um, you know, a full screen mode. Uh, um, it might be your other monitor. Yeah. Let's see if I can switch monitors for this. There we go. Do you see the full screen or do you see the presenter mode? Full screen. Okay. We'll run with that. All right, folks, this is John Marion. I'd like to say first, it's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to share my data with you. Um, we have some interesting points that we're gonna bring out throughout the presentation. And as a background, this is the actual data captured from over 100 plus valuations that have been put through the ringer so that they're adjudicated and, and that they're consistent. And what we do with that data is then we now have a- John, you know, I'm so sorry. John, I'm sorry. You know what I realized? I think this may, <laughs> I thought it was full screen, but I think it may actually be your computer background because I see two people uh, in a field by some water. That's Is that your slide <laughs> or is that your? Okay. No, no, that's the background for a screen. All right, let me see if I okay. can change screens here. Okay. Okay. No, it keeps wanting to go back to the other monitor. Now I just had to figure out how so to now, change screen. Yeah, you know, so now it's the, the screen with your presenter view. If you change the view from here, um, you can Okay, I'm changing the monitor. Are you seeing the CIS, uh, the CQE logo or? Yes, the CQE, slide? yep. Okay, then we got one more to go. There we go. Okay, you should be seeing the title slide. Yep, now we're good. Okay, sorry about that, folks. Uh, three monitors and I guessed wrong three times. All right, um, so the basis of this is you have to be this tall to ride. If you don't have metrics by which you can judge things, you don't know where you're going with it. You don't know whether things are good or bad. And one of the questions we get 
almost in every evaluation is how good are we? And the question is relative to what you're measuring it against. So we've created this corpus as to say just how tall you are. Do you fit, where do you fit on a scale versus 100 other applications of similar nature? Now, before we get started, I have to go through the, what MITRE is. I work for the MITRE Corporation, and this is to keep the lawyers happy. This is where MITRE is a not-for-profit organization, and we operate research and development centers sponsored by the federal government. And there's some words here about it, but MITRE's sole focus is to operate these FFRDCs. We have no bottom line. We are there just to provide the top engineering, the hard-hitting answers, and the actual bottom line truth. We have a culture of sharing information and providing information, and everything we do is in the interest of the public people. So that's our, where MITRE comes from. Next slide is what I do here is I have a two-focus job where I have a strategic port where I work with OSD, the Office of Secretary of Defense and the Department of Homeland Security um, for software assurance community practice and for supply chain and assurance communities. That's the strategic side. And the tactical side is I run MITRE's software quality assurance evaluation teams. Now, with those teams, we've evaluated over 230 million lines of code, unclassified through top secret SCI classifications. We've done it in over 120 languages. We do it as a subject matter expert in the loop evaluation team. So we look at both the source code and the documentation. We use multiple COTS static and dynamic analysis code analyzers for reference to the SMEs. And this way the tools are providing information to the subject matter expert and not being taken as ground truth. Then we highlight what's good in the code and the documentation and we identify what could require improvement. And we all recognize that all software that's non-trivial requires improvement. So we put all that together, we come up with 100 evaluations. So we hold these truths to be self-evident We've heard that phrase many times. My answer to that is, where's your data on that? We hear many times people will quote something or quote percentages, and when we ask them to find out where the real data is behind that, they can't come up with the data. Part of this research study was to come up with data behind the statements we make. So when we look at what do you say after 100 evaluations and over 84 million lines of code, dozen different languages, whew, Let's get some more data, because we're just scratching the surface. But what do these 100 evaluations tell us? Well, if we look at them, we can put together a graph. Now, this graph here is the basis of the corpus of data we're using, and it's broken into different areas. We have corpus into four quartiles. The upper right-hand side is where we look at quality is too high, and we want to focus on functionality. Now, the vertical axis is maintainability, and the horizontal axis is reliability. And these are calculated, all machine calculated, there's no human in the loop here, so that we can get repeatable results across the board and repeatable results from evaluation to evaluation. Any cornerstone of a repeatable process means it has to be repeatable, it has to be public, and it has to be available for anybody to be able to reproduce your data on it. And that's what we're looking for here. So the upper right-hand corner is where quality is really too high. You're not focusing enough on functionality. The next zone is what we call the Goldilocks zone, where it's a good balance of quality and functionality. As a good friend of mine, John Keene, would often say, you could have excellent quality code that does nothing. In this case, what we're looking for is good quality code that does the majority of its functionality. And for those of you who don't know, John Keene is also affectionately known as the software angel of death. Okay, when we move and to... I'll add, I'll add for you, John, too, just because I, I have, I think, more visibility. John is on the webinar, so I'm sure he, he says hello. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll go back now. Okay. John Kim and I share a lot of the same passion for code quality and making actionable results out of it. Moving on, we're looking at the pink zone now. This is where quality needs minor improvement. You're moving up on the maintainability list or you're moving up on the reliability list or you're favoring one over the other and you really want a more balanced application. But there's a set of things you can do to correct that. The fourth zone is the blue zone. This is where quality needs significant improvement. Your maintainability is down, your reliability is down or both. 
And these are where the majority of the costs come in a project over its life cycle. So when we look at that, we then put in standard deviation markers. So we created a standard deviation one, two standard deviations, three standard deviations. And this gives you an idea when you map your application into this data, where you sit. And that's where dragons live, is outside that range. It's not unusual for a program that has never been put through a formal evaluation process to wind up out here in the where the dragons live. But after the first or second time they've been through the process, they've been able to clean up all the low-hanging fruit, the false positives, and they bring themselves back up into the corpus. And this is what <clears throat> it's valuable to them to know how they rate against other applications. Next slide is, this is the actual data that created that corpus. These are the 108 data points that we calculated and laid out which formed this set of data. You can see some up in the green, yellow, pink, blue zones, and a couple outside of the blue zone on the bottom. Now that's a, that's a graphical anomaly because originally these blocks were actual blocks, squares, and the blue zone extended further down. But being a practitioner, we recognize that if you're in that corner of the blue zone or the corner of the pink zone or the corner of the yellow zone, you really belong with the other zone ahead of it. So we're, uh, we've adjusted the zones to fit what we're seeing in, re in the practition of where we are with the data. So when we look at an application, we can say it, it's either in the zone or out of the zone. Okay, and that's the, the basically the data comprising the corpus. Well, once we have that, we have lots of other aspects of the data that we pull together, and we start to be able to ask questions about what's going on. We use maintainability and reliability, and at this point, I'd like to take a moment to define how we define maintainability and how we define reliability. Okay. Maintainability, we believe, is 23% complexity, 11% architecture, 22% programming practices, 22% naming conventions, 11% documentation, and 11% size. Now these are specified in software quality attributes. We can bring it down further, or we can bring it up into the software quality subcharacteristics, and then you can start pushing this directly into the CISC standard for quality. When we look at reliability, we have the same breakdown, 25% complexity, 13 for architecture, 25 for programming practices, 25 for naming conventions, and 12 for size. That's the corpus and the value that we're using for these data points. When we look at the CISC standard, we can see that on the left-hand side, you have reliability, deals with maturity, availability, fault tolerance, recoverability, and compliance. And we can map those down into the attributes we're using. We can look on the right-hand side and see maintainability for modularity, reusability, analyzability, changeability, modifications, stability, testability, and compliance. And we can map our attributes back into those. When this standard was being put together, MITRE was a contributor to it, and our idea of what maintainability was helped format this, this graph. And CISC took it a step further, and we're bringing that information back into the process. So it's a give and take. We'll put something out there, they'll take it and run with it, they'll enhance it, we'll bring it back, we'll move on for it. The idea is it's standards-based. That's a corner post. We have the ability to work with something that industry has agreed upon as these are the right ways to do things, these are the things you want to measure, and that it's all automatable. We want to take the human out of the loop in this so that we have something that's repeatable across projects and across applications. At this point, I like to go through a what would normally be an audience participation but we'll do it um, as a presentation we'll go through some true or false there's a bunch of questions i'm going to ask and i'm going to ask all of them up front so you get an idea where we're going with it and then we'll go through each question individually as to what your answers are you might want to take a pen and paper and jot down what your answers are and see how well you, you fit with the graph but we're going to challenge some of the common misconceptions in software 79% of the vulnerabilities that exist in WILD start off as quality software development cycle. It costs $1 to fix a bug in the development phase, $100 to fix it in the test phase, and $1,000 to fix it in the field. 
The dependent libraries I use can be vulnerable even if I do not use the vulnerable functions. As code size, which is the software lines of code, increases, software becomes harder to maintain. As maintainability increases, which is becomes easier to maintain, reliability becomes easier to maintain. As maintainability and reliability increase, so does scalability. So if your maintainability is getting better and your reliability is getting better, you should have an easier time scaling. Scanning source code does not improve the quality of the source code. 80% of the cost of a project over its entire life cycle is expended in the maintenance phase. And the last group are agile development methodology is better than waterfall. Now we usually get a stir in the audience on that one. Java is the best language to use in the Department of Defense programs. And technical debt is just bad. And the envelope, please. So the first one, 79% of the software vulnerabilities that exist in the wild start off as quality issues during the development phase of the software development lifecycle. Well, that's true so far. I've been reviewing the CWEs, which is the common weakness enumeration, and categorizing whether the CWE is a software-related issue that could have been addressed in the development phase, or if it was something that happened outside of that. Now, I've only been able to evaluate 350 CWEs, and 276 of those had quality that could have been corrected in the software development lifecycle. There are over 1,000 CWEs out there, so we've only looked at 35% of the data, and we're already up at 79%. Now, the Defense Acquisition University, DAU, claims that there's 84% of the CWEs can be fixed in the software development lifecycle during the development phase. But I have yet to find anybody there who can tell me exactly where they got that number from. Hence, I'm going through the data and coming up with the real data behind the phrase. Once we have the data, we have a basis by which we can make valid statements. So what do we usually do when we have a vulnerability? Well, we throw a security feature at it. So here's our security feature. We have an access way to a runway, and we don't want people driving over it. So what do the bad guys do? They drive around the security feature. That's the same way we work cross-site scripting, which is CWE 79, or SQL injection, CWE 89. So every bridge we throw at, or every gate we throw at an IA attacker, an intruder, they're finding ways around it. If we could fix the problems in the software development phase during development, we wouldn't need to have any of these problems. But on the other hand, there's the adage of locking the barn door after the horse comes home. But if your barn looks like this, which is equivalent to what our software looks like, is locking the door really the answer? I think fixing the barn is the better answer. Which brings us to our next question, is it costs $1 to fix a bug in the development phase, or $100 to fix it in the test phase, or $1,000 to fix it in the field? Here I have to defer to Capers Jones and his research on this, and his answer is, it. Well, if it's found during requirements phase, it's $250. If it's found during the design, it's $500. If it's during coding and testing, it's $1,250. And if it gets out into the release, it's $5,000. He goes on to further say that using this type of measurement has problems. It doesn't take into account a lot of the things we do in development and bug chasing. And his last statement is rather important says that the cost per defect metric has such serious shortcomings for economic studies of software quality that a case might be made for considering this metric to be a form of professional malpractice for economic analysis of software quality. So we have to look back and see where is it that we're looking to save the money on this and that comes down to how much we're spending maintaining and chasing bugs versus how much we're spending to develop them. The next question I proposed was the dependent libraries I can use can be vulnerable even if I do not use the vulnerable functions. So you have a library, it has two functions in it. One is foo, one is bar. You're using the foo function and the bar function has a known vulnerability against it, but you don't use it in your code. It's still compiled into your library. So the answer is true, you can still use that library even though you didn't call the vulnerable function. But do you really want to accept that risk? 
if there's executable code in your deliverable, it can be executed, even if you don't call that function. You're increasing your attack surface for the adversary. It's better to use libraries that have fewer vulnerabilities than wantonly just using vulnerabilities and not caring about them. Next question we're going to look at is slot versus maintainability. As code size, which is the software lines of code, increases, the software becomes harder to maintain. We find that to be true. And here's where we take the data and we put it into a graphic form. And we're going to explain this chart because we're going to see a bunch of them like this. On the left-hand side is SLOC. It's on the vertical axis, and it is in blue. On the bottom of the chart, you'll see the blue line and the blue dots. The blue dots represent each data point, and the blue line represents the exponential trend line for that data. That's an ordered set of SLOC. So in the, 70, sorry, in the 82 samples that we're looking at, the SLOC is ordered from left to right, from smallest to largest. We then overlay on that maintainability in red, which is the vertical axis on the right, and we have the same thing, where the dots are the actual data that correspond to the SLOC data, and the solid red line is the trend line, in this case, a polynomial order two trend line. And we see that as SLOC increases, maintainability decreases on a general whole. So we're able to show the data showing how we're getting at these pieces of information. We're able to present that, yes, as SLOC increases, maintainability decreases. When we look at the same data for reliability, we see even a stronger correlation that as SLOC increases, reliability decreases. This is indicator that the smaller applications are more reliable, more maintainable. Looking at the next one is Java SLOC versus reliability. Now we picked on Java SLOC particularly because it's a favorite language within the DOD, and there's some interesting data behind it. So when we look at that, we come up with the answer, Java is not the best language to use for DOD programs. And when we look at the data, we find that SLOC versus reliability falls into the standard pattern we'd expect. That as Java SLOC increases, the reliability of the code decreases. That's consistent across every language we've looked at. However, when we look at Java SLOC versus maintainability, we come up with the following chart. The SLOC is the same, but the maintainability is increasing. Based on this graph, it says that the more SLOC you have in Java, the easier it is to maintain. And that's backwards from everything we've seen in every other language. So we have to ask ourselves, why does the maintainability go up when Java SLOC goes down? And to do that, we have to examine that right now we have 38 samples in this corpus that represent Java SLOC. Now that should be statistically significant, it's over 30 but it's still a small amount of data. We take it a step further. We had to go look at what the Java code is actually doing. And when we look at the Java code that is being used within the Department of Defense, we see that most of the Java code is being used to tie together various libraries and frameworks. In other words, it's not doing programmatic work anymore. It's just tying in this library to that library to get this function into that framework and putting things up on the screen. So, the conclusion we can come to is that we've gotten very good at writing glue code, but it's still a very small sample. So when you consider that Java libraries are chock full of known vulnerabilities, we're getting a false sense of security here that Java is a good language to work with. We've moved the problem out of something that we directly control into something that is slightly out of our control. This is where using a function like OWASP dependency check to look at the national vulnerability database to run your library against that to see how many vulnerabilities you're, you're bringing in that you might not recognize you're bringing in because they're not directly related to your code. That's a free application. It's easy to run. It's something that should be part of your, your DevSecOps chain or your regular development process. The thing to remember about it is the National Vulnerability Database does not have all of the vulnerabilities and dependency check does not report on all of them. It's estimated between 10 and 20% are being visible through dependency check. So again, your libraries are your biggest weak point in this scenario. But it's only 38 data points. 
And I've asked my friends at CAST to come up with, can we get access to their database anonymously of their Java code within the DOD? I want a larger database to run this analysis against to see if we're looking at an abnormal trend on a small section of data, or if this is against the larger database. The more data we have, the more accurate the number becomes, the higher confidence we have in it. The expectation is that if we add enough data, the Java maintainability is going to fall into the line with all of the other languages. And for the record, for all the other languages we've looked at, maintainability and reliability decrease with increased slock. So the larger applications, the harder they are to maintain, the harder they, the less reliable they become. We've been talking about maintainability and reliability, but how do they work together? We ask is, as maintainability increases, does reliability increase? And we find that that's a true statement. When we look at the next chart, we see that maintainability in blue and reliability in red, that there's a strong correlation between the two. That as maintainability increases, which is our ordered set, and reliability increases with it. When we look at maintainability and reliability versus scalability, we don't know. And the reason for that is, there's no industry accepted definition of what scalability is in software. Are we thinking thin apps, fat apps, cloud apps? Uh, are we looking at embedded code, firmware, FPGAs? All of these have different facets of what scalability could be. But this question was very important to many of the DOD customers. So we put together a model based on what scalability might look like if it were thin or thick apps, not into the firmware, et cetera. But we went and looked at that. We came up with a proposal for what scalability could look like in this context. Now we have a model, a hypothesis, and a model that surrounds that hypothesis. We run it against the data that we've collected. The scalability we came up with was 15% complexity, 21% architecture, 31% programming practices, 15% naming conventions, and 9% documentation. When we look at the chart, we can do maintainability versus scalability, and we see that there's a reasonable, there's a, a flat correlation here. We're not really sure if that's gonna tell us anything. Again, having more data will tell us where we sit within that realm. When we look at reliability versus scalability, now we're seeing a greater correlation that as reliability increases, scalability is decreasing. Intuitively, I would expect these to go the other way. So it's something we're watching within the model. The real issue behind this is when we look at slock, we see that as slock increases, scalability decreases. The model only allows us to look at the data we have. Since it's a new model, we don't have the secondary data points yet. That is, we can evaluate data against a particular scan that says this scalability number is associated with this piece of source code at this point in time. We don't have the follow-on scan that says what its scalability look like a year from now when we take a secondary point and then compare the two. We're starting to collect that data. So we've put together the hypothesis, the model, and now we're collecting the data on it. We have the initial data that we're working with, and over the next couple of years, we're going to be collecting scalability data as we go to see if the model needs refinement. We move to the next question is, scanning source code improves the quality of the source code? Well, that's false. And yes, that is a trick question. The reason behind that is scanning does nothing but tell you what's in your source code. It doesn't correct the source code. You actually have to act on what the scans tell you to go find and fix the source code. You have to identify the false positives. You have to go find the true positives and make a structured effort to correct those to knock down your technical debt in the process, and that's where the improvement comes in your code. Just scanning it doesn't do anything. The next slide is an example of this. This is a case where we had a DOD contractor who had been in place for 20 years, and the government was not very happy with the quality of their work, the users in the field were not very happy with the reliability and maintainability of the 
the code they were getting. And this contract was now up for rebid. In other words, somebody else could get the contract. We were asked to come in and evaluate the code in preparation for some other contractor picking up the code base and being the contractor of record from that point out. We captured the data that represents point V1, Victor 1. And you can see that there's a large technical debt there and it's on the edge of the blue zone. Through mechanisms I can't describe, this contractor managed to hold on to the contract and got the contract for the next two years. So six months after the first scan, we came back in and did a second scan. Now, I got ahead of myself there. When we came in to do the V1 scan, the contractors looked at the tools we were using and said, what are these? We have never seen these tools. We've never heard of these tools. Now, this is standard static analysis and dynamic analysis tools, cyclomatic complexity, McCabe stuff, some basic stuff that we hold as this is the way software is developed. But there's a whole part of the world out there who doesn't know this yet. And it was surprising to us that they didn't know about it. It was more surprising to them that there were these tools out there. So when we came back in six months later and took sample V2, this team, uh, and it's an older team, had fully embraced using static and dynamic analysis tools of using a, a DevOps type environment to work down their debt, work down the, the, the problems they're seeing, and they produced a bill that was higher in maintainability, higher in reliability, and significantly less in technical debt. It was about 30% less in technical debt, all in a six month period, from going from never having seen these tools to using them effectively. The customer was actually quite happy that the software was improving. As a spot check, we came back 18 months later after that and took the sample V3. Now this is two years start to finish from never having seen these tools to fully embracing them as their culture. They have significantly reduced their technical debt, they have significantly improved their maintainability, and they have significantly improved their reliability numbers. So scanning itself doesn't improve your software, but acting on it does. Next slide is cost versus the software development lifecycle. 80% of the cost of a project is expended in the lifecycle, is expended during the maintenance phase. And I don't have the slide here to present where that data comes from, but throughout the DOD survey that we did, that is a true statement, that the majority of the cost of a development effort is in the maintenance cycle. So we can reduce the maintenance cycle. We can significantly improve the functionality that's given. We can improve that there's more functionality given and save money in the process. So delivering software faster, more reliable, easier to maintain at less cost, I think that works in any market. Technical debt is just bad. There's no argument anywhere. I've yet to find anybody who thinks technical debt is good. But when we look at technical debt versus maintainability, we see that as technical debt increases in blue, we see that maintainability decreases. So here we have the data is telling us what we intuitively believe, that technical debt is bad. So the more technical debt you have, the harder it is to maintain your application. Same thing goes for reliability. In fact, the curve is accelerating with technical debt as it gets larger, reliability getting worse, faster. When we throw scalability in there, we see that as technical debt increases, scalability is increasing. That's counterintuitive. So that's the point where we looked at the model and said, okay, we need to go back and make some modifications to the model that should fall in line with what we're expecting to see as a change in our hypothesis. So we're in the process of respinning what the definition of, or the working definition is of scalability. But we wouldn't have known that if we hadn't been able to put it against this data corpus. The last slide I'm gonna talk about is a data corpus of CVEs. Now, for those out there who aren't aware what a CVE is, it is the common vulnerability and enumeration, sorry, it's common vulnerability and exposure. That is a list of vulnerabilities that have been found in the field and fixed by their source code owner. Vulnerability is released when the, when the vulnerability is repaired. So this chart shows that when we started collecting data back in January of 99, we've been counting how many vulnerabilities show up every month. And as you can see, the chart is increasing in size. So we're catching a lot more bugs faster. 
Unfortunately, someone got hold of this chart and added the following things to it. They said, this is when agile development started. And look at all the vulnerabilities that were created during the reign of agile. So therefore, agile is bad. That we should be doing something different than agile. Now, at this point, usually there's a couple of people in the audience who start raising their hands like, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's not the way to look at this chart. And that's right. When Agile started, it had nothing to do with the number of vulnerabilities discovered and fixed. What we can say is that during the reign of Agile, we fixed and found more vulnerabilities, but that had nothing to do with the Agile process. The takeaway from this slide is, be careful of what the data on the slide is actually telling you and try not to form it into what you think the answer is. Let the data drive you. What's next? We need to collect more data. We've got 108 samples in this data. I've got another 85 ready to start being put into this corpus. So we have almost doubled the data size. We still need more data than that. 200 samples is a, is a pittance compared to the amount of software that's out there. We want to publish a paper on what data we have, how we acquired it. It has to be completely anonymized. And then we ask questions from the audience. What is it that you'd like to know about this? Great, and we've got, we've got a question here. Um, what was the software written in that you scanned and how did that compare to other software used in, in DOD? What was the software we scanned? Yeah, the software it. written in, yep. The software was written in, in a variety of different languages, and we were able to separate out each language for different parts of it. The maintainability and reliability are measures that apply across languages. And when we were looking at Java versus C Sharp versus C versus C++, we could then see trends within each of those languages. Um, if you were asking what tools we were using for generating the automated numbers for here, uh, we were primarily using CAST's application intelligence platform since it conforms pretty closely to the CISC standard. And we can get access to the attributes that we're looking for that make up the indices we've created. Mm -hmm. And John, if you want to take a look um, at the question too, you can always open up the the tab there but i'm going to keep going we got another one in here uh, but if you want to preview um next question is what platforms mainframe mini etc these are predominantly um pc platforms in that respect they're all they're server platforms there are desktops laptops um, there are some handhelds, and there are a couple mainframe pieces in there as well. And we looked at them across the different types of machines to see if we were seeing any deviation in maintainability, reliability, quality, and we were not able to determine any difference between whether it's written for a mainframe application, whether it's written for a PC, whether it's written for a server, or if it's written for the cloud. Mm -hmm. Okay. He says, thank you. <laughs> Good. And while we wait for uh, uh, some more questions to come in, um, just a reminder too, in the handouts tab, we have a copy of the presentation um, that you can take with you. We're also taking a, a video recording, so we'll, we'll post this um, after the webinar. It should be up tomorrow too on the CISC site, the video, so. But any other questions? Now is a, is a good time. Um, We'll give this another if there's any other discussion. correlations you'd like to see, that would be something I'd like to know as well, so we can look at the data for that. Age of applications. That is actually a good question. The age of applications runs from stuff that is currently being developed today back 25 years for some of the applications. And it doesn't fall true that the older applications are better or worse, and the newer applications are better or worse. 
We've seen newer applications that are just as bad as some 20-year-old applications, and we've seen some 25-year-old applications that are better than some of the new stuff that's being written. We find that different languages have different qualities associated with them, but we're not ready to make an endorsement of one language over another. Okay. Well, and I'll I'll take this opportunity too to to mention because we we just locked in dates. So CISC, uh, we host uh, the Cyber Resilience Summit, you know, every October and. So I just wanted folks to, to know on the line that uh, save the date for October 16th in Arlington. Um, John, I hope you come out too <laughs> and, and can talk a bit more about, about this research. Um, so we're gonna open registration for that uh, next week. So look for that. Um, John, oh, we got one more question here. Let's see, is there any data on the time spent by teams to increase maintainability and reliability? No, not that we're privy to. That happens inside the developer shop and we only get to do snapshots of it. But we can tell by, if we get in there for multiple scans that the technical debt is dropping and the reliability maintainability increasing. So it tends to imply that their velocity is improving. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? I think we estimated a good time with 45 minutes. And also Dr. Curtis is, 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 is on too if there's any other questions that folks want to ask. Hi Bill, I know you're on mute, but welcome. <laughs> um, okay, well, I think, I think that's it for questions. Um, Thank you, John. Thank you so much. And thanks to everybody that, that hopped on here today. Um, sorry, actually, we, got, we just got one more in. John, if you want to take this real quick. Um, does your research show a better performance with Agile versus Waterfall if they incorporate routine checking? Uh, that's me, me thinking about the, the answer for that moment. Um, when we're looking at code quality, it's a snapshot in time. It doesn't show which methodology was used. And if you think of Agile could be considered trickle fall, which is a very small waterfall on a, a one week or two week basis, that there really doesn't see too much difference on it. But where we do see advantages are, is if they're using a DevOps chain or a DevSecOps chain. We do see improvement in performance there and speed at which technical debt is being burned down. And Bill, now that you're on the audio too, if you wanna, uh, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Um, uh, does your research show a better performance with Agile versus Waterfall if they incorporate routine checking? Uh, the only difference we found between Agile and Waterfall, actually we found that both of them were, were not as good as um, a hybrid method that has the upfront uh, time spent in architecture and design like like a traditional more waterfallish project and then follows that with the rapid agile iterations uh, that end up being superior to both pure agile or pure waterfall next question we're getting some more here um who does the upfront analysis or design with who in all caps Maybe for you, John. Yeah, I'm trying to read the question. It's just like have a small screen there. Who does the upfront design analysis? Are you talking in terms of the evaluation of the software? Um, that would be our team. If you're talking about what's being built, that would be the development team. Okay, well, I think that's it for the questions. Um, 
so we're good. Let, let's let's wrap up. Um, thank you again, John. Thank you everybody hopping on. Um, again, we'll we'll have this posted to the site tomorrow. Um, and I hope to uh, see you again soon on a future CISC webinar. You guys have a, a good rest of the afternoon. Um, and talk to you soon. Thanks, John. Thanks, Bill. Okay. Bye.